All right, good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to our lawn church service here at the Madison Campus Church. We're so happy that you're here. Um, I want you to go ahead and ask you to do me a favor. If you have your phone, I want you to take it out of your pocket and hold it up for me. If you've got a phone, hold it up for me so they can see you actually have a phone. I know all of you do, so don't pretend like you don't. You've got a phone here. All right. So if you have a phone, now what I want you to do is I want you to open up your YouTube app. I need your YouTube app right now. Go to the search bar. I need you to type in Madison Campus Seventh-day Adventist Church. I need you to find the YouTube channel Campus Seventh-day Adventist Church. And what I want you to do is the subscribe button. Because right now you can see Facebook, and we appreciate Facebook and live stream without anything using mobile data, but YouTube says we're going to stream off. You have to go ahead and have 221. I think we were up to 200 things that are going to be coming your way in the next couple weeks. I don't want to spoil it to take place. Um, and uh, if you are hearing my voice and in a car, but you don't know what the channel is on the FM dial, it's 98.5. That's 98.5 on your FM dial. All right, so there we go. Go ahead and tune in now. All right, we sure love you guys. We're so happy you're part of our Madison campus family. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and have a prayer as we begin. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be in your great creation, the outdoors this morning. We are thankful that you have blessed us with weather that permits us to be outside. And uh, we pray for all those that are at home today uh, for various reasons and that are tuning in. Uh, perhaps they're tuning in live right now or perhaps they are watching this uh, several hours or even days later. Lord, we're just so grateful that they've chosen to be a part of this. Lord, we want to ask that you would um, continue to bless and watch over this community. And uh, just help us to continue to be more and more like you with every day that goes by. We pray in your name. Amen.
remembered what I forgot. We have new members, and we want to introduce them. So I'd like to invite uh, uh, <laughs> Ashley and Kyle to come on down front uh, really quick. They said, well, can we just stand up where we're at? And uh, that would have been the nice thing for Pastor Ken to, to do to let them. But I said, no, everybody needs to see you, and the people at home can't see you. So we're going to have them come down front. Um, I am so excited to uh, introduce you to this lovely, newly married couple. Yeah, yeah right? They are, they are really, truly newlyweds. I think uh, you have been married for all of a week and a half now, right? You can, yeah, excellent. And it was a, uh, just a privilege to be a part of that wedding ceremony. So uh, we have Kyle. He is fantastic. They said, do we have to say anything? I said, I might ask you some questions. And they're like, so I think I'm just going to let them take a little bit of a break. I'll tell you about them unless you want me to interview you. I don't want you to feel left out. Okay. So uh, <laughs> Kyle uh, is uh, in sports management, has a degree in that. And, uh, and so that's kind of his background. And then we have uh, Ashley, who is in fundraising. And uh, not, I don't actually know. It's not fundraising. What would the right phrase for that be? It's a scholarship program. Yeah, she manages a scholarship program. So that's a very cool... Uh, Thing that she's a part of there and so they came to this area and they were looking for a church i've got to tell you during covid 19 this is a hard time to find a church isn't it but they picked us Amen. yeah they picked us aren't we glad so i want to go and have uh the, the thing is that uh, ashley's membership has kind of already come in but kyle's is still kind of working his way through the system but what do you think they're married right the bible says the two shall become one right yeah. So I know it's not exactly the proper order of things, but what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and vote them both into membership. Kyle contingent on everything coming through the way it's supposed to, and it will. But, uh, but we're going to go ahead and make that vote for them as a couple, okay? So do I have a motion to accept them into membership? All right. Do I have a second? I see a second. Uh, if you promise that you're going to love them and treat them like their family, would you go ahead and give them a hand right now? All right, we love you. We're so glad you're a part of our family. Thanks for being good sports and coming up front. And thank you for tolerating your pastor who can't remember things. You don't treat your family well? Yeah. Rick, you always treat your family well. You just, you just, you're a humble man. That's what it is. We now have our children's story, so uh, I'll go ahead and let uh, Jennifer Taylor come front. Thank you so much, Jennifer. The story I have for you today um, took place 10 years before I was born, and it took place way out in the Pacific Ocean on an island, kind of between Australia and Fiji. On this little island lived a young boy named Baribo. Baribo lived on the island with his father, his mother, and his little sister. Baribo's father was a pastor who worked um, as a missionary on that island. Once a month, Brubo's father would get in their little family canoe and travel over to another island that was kind of far away to collect his monthly pay and then canoe back home. And it took him a couple days to do that journey. So on this particular day, Baribo was on the beach of their little island not far from their home, and he was waiting for his father to return from his trip to go get his monthly pay. He knew it was about time for his dad to come home, so he thought, I'll just play on the beach and keep looking out on the horizon and see if my dad's on his way. So sure enough, he was scanning out across where the blue sky meets the deep blue Pacific Ocean, and he saw a little black speck. And he thought, that might be my dad. And sure enough, that speck got bigger and bigger as it got closer and closer, and he could tell it was his dad coming home in their little canoe with his monthly pay. So he ran back up the trail to their house and told his mom, and she grabbed the little sister, and they all went down to the beach to wait for Baribo's dad. Well, when they got back down to the beach, they could tell that Baribo's father was waiting just offshore in his canoe because there was a, a reef, a barrier reef with coral and rocks between the shore and where his dad was, and he needed to wait for a big wave so that his canoe could be high enough over that reef and rocks so he wouldn't crash and to help propel him to shore. So they could tell his dad was waiting there with his paddle in hand, watching and waiting for just the right big wave that could lift him up and over that dangerous area and get him to the shore. So sure enough, in time, there came a really big wave. And they could tell his dad started paddling and paddling as fast as he could to get in that wave and make sure he didn't miss it. 
so it could get him up and over safely to the shore. Well, it did, and he made it to shore, and Baribo ran to help his dad pull the canoe up on the beach, and they hugged and, and were happy that his dad was home, and then all of a sudden, his father got a very serious look on his face, and he started feeling around his pants, and he said, I can't find my envelope of money for my pay that I just picked up. He said, I didn't have a pocket or a backpack, so I tucked my little brown envelope of money into my belt. He said, I wonder when I was paddling so hard in that wave, if the envelope fell out of my belt into the canoe, and then when that big wave came and pushed me to shore and, and the surf and the, and the, um, and the um, salt water spray and everything crashed into my canoe that maybe it washed the envelope of money into the ocean. Oh, they were so sad because they really needed that money to help them through the next month to buy their food and supplies they needed. So they went back home and Baribo said, well, dad, we can do two things. One, we can go to the beach every day and I can check to see if maybe the money will float to shore. Because sometimes things, you know, the surf tosses things back up onto the beach. And second of all, we can pray. And his dad said, Baribo, you're absolutely right. We can check every day. He said, that it would take a miracle because that's a little brown envelope in a very big ocean. And not only were there uh, paper money bills in there, but there was silver coins. And the silver coins are heavy and they probably made that envelope sink to the bottom of the ocean. But he said, remember Baribo in the story in Old Testament, in 2 Kings of Elisha, where he made an axe head float. If God can make an axe head float, he could make some silver coins float. So they prayed that night. And early next morning, Baribo ran down to the beach, and he searched under the shells and the rocks. But there was no money. So they prayed at lunchtime, and they prayed that evening. Still no money. The next morning, they prayed again, and Baribo ran down to the beach, and, and still no money. And he went at noontime after they prayed, and still no money. And that second evening, they prayed, and he went down to the beach one more time. And he took his little sister so she could play in the sand, and she was covering her feet with sand. And, and he noticed some birds diving for some fish. And as he watched those birds diving for fish, he saw some black specks on the water. And he thought, well, that's weird. What are, fish don't just float on the top of the water. What could those black specks be? And they were coming closer with the waves. So he waded out, and there floating on the water towards him were bills of paper money. And he thought, God has answered our prayer. And he snatched up all those paper bills and collected them. And he ran home and he told his mom and dad, Jesus answered our prayer. He answered our prayer. The money was right there in the waves. So they sat down and they counted it. And all that was missing was one piece of paper money and the silver coins. But they were so grateful that God had answered their prayer and done a miracle. And Baribo said, Mom and Dad, I want you to see where this miracle happened. I want you to come to the beach with me so I can show you exactly where this miracle took place and how it happened. So they went right down to the beach, and he showed them right where he stood and had watched the birds diving and saw the black specks and where he'd waited out and found the paper money. And as he was pointing to that spot, he saw something else. It was a piece of driftwood. Look at this handy helper. It was a piece of driftwood. And on that piece of driftwood was one piece of paper money and a little stack of silver coins. It was the exact amount that had been missing and left that he hadn't found earlier. Amen. God, that was an amazing miracle that God did for Baribo and his family. And you know what? Just because that happened 10 years before I was born, doesn't mean that God still doesn't do miracles today. Right. He cares about every little thing in your life, the big worries and things in your life. And when you pray, I just want you to know, boys and girls, that we have a God that still does miracles today and still answers prayers. Right. Good morning, church. Yeah. It is time now for our church offering. So if the deacons would just be prepared, we'll have a little prayer, so just hang on. A uh, little report about our church budget. You want to talk about miracles in Abrigo's family? You know, we've got one right here. You know, there's a lot of folks that are struggling through this COVID-19 situation, trying to keep jobs and trying to keep food and shelter. But you folks, through your generosity and your faithfulness, have kept our church budget more than just afloat. 
you know, we're probably just a little behind right now in our expenses, a little bit more than our intake, our revenue. But I've been a member of this church for over 35 years. And to say we're going into September with a $4,000 deficit, sometimes it's twenty-five to 40000 through the summer. You folks continue to give, continue to support. And that is a miracle for us. So thank you. And that the deacons now will just bow our heads for prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, you know, you bless us every day with just the breath of life and the ability to share the gifts that you give us to back to you and to your church so that we can help others. Thank you, Lord. Be with us this week. Help us always to be your shining light. In Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen. <laughs> Will you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to be able to come together in a special way each Sabbath to worship you. Under these trees, it reminds us of what it might have been like for the early believers to sit on a hillside in Galilee and hear you speak and teach truth and speak hope. Thank you for our congregation, um, this church family, um, and that together we belong to the family of God. And as such, that we're able to support 
encourage, and build each other up as families should do. As we attempt to navigate this world that right now is filled with fear, anxiety, division, chaos, and uncertainty, we pray that the Holy Spirit would help us hold tight to the promises in your word that we know to be true. Promises such as these that you laid the foundations of this earth. You set up kings and kingdoms. Nothing is out of your control. Righteousness and justice are yours. You're faithful to those that love you. And you provide peace that exceeds our understanding. Lord, we ask that you forgive our sins and make us more like you. Continue to redeem us and draw us close to you. I know that every person here has prayer requests on their hearts and minds. Thank you for listening to our countless pleadings for your intercession. Thank you for being a God who understands what we're going through, for being a God who is near and not far away, and for being powerful enough to be able to answer those prayers. Please continue to be with us here this morning. Accept our worship of you. And like David the psalmist, may we praise you today with all that we are and never forget the good things you do for us. Amen. Yesterday was a little scary, especially after we've gone through a tornado already once earlier before the shutdown. And yesterday, while I was on my way to pick up the kids, the sirens, again, another tornado passing by. the school to just hunker down with them. I heard Mr. Pichette playing the guitar and the kids singing to Jesus. It made my heart so feel this peace and I forgot about this tornado and it passed and nothing happened. It just reminds me And he gives us peace in the middle of the storm. I'm going to sh share this verse with you. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So no matter what you're struggling with right now, what your tornado is in your life personally, know that God can give you peace. I don't want to be afraid every time I face the waves. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to fear the storm just because I hear it roar. I don't want to fear the storm. I don't want to fear the storm.
Hello, happy Sabbath. Aren't these just awesome? <laughs> ah, especially in the nice Tennessee humidity. I love it. Happy Sabbath, everybody. I was just thinking about how much I really like church on the lawn. Amen. I just like it. I love our sanctuary. I'm so excited to see how beautiful and awesome it's going to be when it's finished. But until then, I really like meeting outside. I am an outside kind of person. And I was thinking about how it just feels a little less nerve wracking to like stand here on the lawn with you guys than like to be behind a pulpit and like go up the steps and it just feels like we're hanging out. And I just like it. I hope you guys are enjoying it as well. We are DIYing church. That's what we're doing, right? This is a do-it-yourself church service. We don't have the building right now. We don't have, you know, we can't in this county, we shouldn't really be like meeting this big group of people all together inside. We got to be outside. It's kind of better this way. So we're just kind of doing it ourselves. And that goes along with kind of the culture that we've gotten into. How many of you love watching DIY videos on YouTube? I could watch them all day. DIY a bleach tie-dye t-shirt. DIY a bedroom makeover. DIY complicated plumbing and electrical. Just kidding. Don't do that. I actually rarely attempt the DIYs myself but I like to watch other people do it. But I like the concept. I don't want to have to pay someone else to do something that I could do myself. And if you think about it, there's probably a lot of things that we could do ourselves if we took the time to learn, if we have the patience and put in the effort. And it's kind of become a cultural thing, probably because of Google and YouTube. You can Google anything and figure out how to do it yourself right. for free. But there are certain things that you should not DIY. Now, there are probably a lot of people who could do this, but I am going to go out on a limb and say most of us probably should not DIY a haircut. <laughs> I've done that before. One of my friends in college said, can you cut my hair? And I did. It took me like two and a half to three hours, and he looked like a mushroom most of the time. And there was a point where both of us panicked. <laughs> DIYing a haircut, probably not something that you should do. And I know a lot of other people are perfectly capable of this, but knowing my math skills, or lack thereof, and my filling out paperwork skills, or lack thereof, I do not DIY my taxes. Somebody else does that for me, a professional. You probably should not DIY a root canal. There are lots of things that you should not DIY, but in our culture, I would not be surprised if someone tried. YouTube it, see if anyone tried to DIY a root canal. Okay, <laughs> we live in a DIY culture. I took a class this summer. I actually took two. You've heard me say it before. You've heard me say that every single time I get up to preach in like the fall time. Pastor Chelsea gets up and talks about school because I've been in school every summer for as long as I've lived here. I have one more to go and then I'll be done and I will quit talking about it, hopefully. But this summer was different. Obviously, I couldn't pack all my stuff or some of, not all, some of my stuff and move back into the dorm at Southern like I've been doing every summer. Nothing will make you feel so old as being a person not in your 20s moving into a dorm room. So I didn't have to do that this summer. I got to stay home and just experience school online. So for all of the elementary and high school kids who have to suffer through that, I feel ya. I did it this summer too, but it was kind of cool because I got to take this class called World Religions and I love learning about world religions. I find it completely fascinating. And when I got my reading assignment, which included 
a big, almost 400-page textbook called Anthology of World Religions, I was excited. And I enjoyed every page, and I'm not being sarcastic right now. I think it's interesting. And it was a bunch of selections of scripture from all the major world religions. And I've taken world religion class before in undergrad and in high school, but I had never delved so deep into the actual scriptures of all these major religions. There are so many links between the culture and the worldview of different parts of the world that affect religion and how people understand spirituality. There's connections between the different religions and how they react and interact with each other. And I love, as a Christian, looking for things that I can learn from other religions and what they value in life. I love the respect that I began to develop for all of these different points of view. And you have to develop respect for a point of view and an understanding that is different than your own if you're ever going to witness Amen. to someone who is not exactly like you. It was a good class. And maybe one of the things that I found most personally helpful is that it caused me to question what I believe in a good way. Why does this strike me as weird or different or fascinating? What do I really believe? What have I been taking granted, taking for granted about what I know to be true about God? But I will admit that there were times as I was reading this big textbook that I thought to myself, oh, I like that. Oh, that's really attractive. I can see why people are attracted to this or that aspect of these other religions. And I was really glad that I do have a firm grasp of my own faith, a firm grasp of truth and reality as I delved into other ways of thinking. Because without a firm grasp of truth, without a solid understanding of what a privilege it is to serve God for who he really is. It can be so easy to be swept into the culture around you because it influences us whether we like it or not and whether we notice it or not. Our view of reality is shaped by where we grow up, by the life experiences that we've had, by the things that we listen to or watch or talk about, by the community in which we live. We are influenced by this DIY culture that we live in. So we've been studying the book of Jonah in youth Sabbath school. I have been teased for mining ideas from Sabbath school, but you know, sometimes God just puts something on your heart and he's like, no, this is what I know you've talked about. I, this is what you have to talk about. So we're going with it. But oh man, is the book of Jonah good. Just ask anyone who has been attending youth Sabbath school class for the last month. We have been blown away by everything that is in there. In this book that so many of us are so used to and so familiar with, right? I mean, Jonah is a classic. That is a Sabbath school favorite. Am I a badmintist for not having seen the Veggie Tales Jonah because I haven't seen it yet? But we, we, we love the story of Jonah. Jonah is a crazy book. Jonah is an account of God doing something amazing despite every effort that his own prophet took to thwart God's plans. The book of Jonah is a story of God's true character and intentions being revealed despite Jonah the prophet's blatant misrepresentation of who God is and Jonah's complete lack of willingness to participate in God's goals. It's a story of a follower of God behaving badly, behaving in such a human way, and I have to admit it, I love the story of Jonah because I so totally relate to Jonah. Tradition holds that Jonah himself wrote the book of Jonah. That is an interesting thing to think about. When you go 
to write your memoirs, when you publish your autobiography, is it going to read like, and then I told God, yeah, I'm mad at you for being so nice. Like Jonah was a deeply flawed person and a deeply honest person. And I feel like the fact that he was so willing to put it all out there, no matter how bad it made him look, makes me respect him more. And we should not waste Jonah's transparency. There is a lot to learn from the book of Jonah, and not all of it has to do with don't run away from God. There's a lot more in there. So let's delve into just a little bit of the book of Jonah first by talking about what we know, or at least what we can infer about Jonah the person. Very basic things, okay? We know that Jonah was an Israelite, okay? Super basic. What that means is that he worshiped God, the one true God. It means that he had access to all of the scriptures that they had written up until that point. He had access and he knew the biblical account of creation. He had the Ten Commandments. He had the Mosaic Law. As an Israelite, Jonah worshiped in the sanctuary. He watched the lambs being sacrificed in the temple. He smelled the incense from the altar that was inside the holy place. And I imagine that every year on the Day of Atonement, he felt the solemnity of the event as the high priest ventured past that curtain into the most holy place. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, all these different things that went along with the sanctuary service, how the Israelites of the Old Testament worshiped God, you should look it up. It is fascinating. It is or was a visual representation of everything that God and Jesus do on our behalf to save us. Everything, almost everything in that temple represents Jesus. Jesus was the lamb, Jesus was the candles, Jesus was the bread, Jesus was the priest. Everything is about Jesus. Well, of course we've got the most holy place and that's God, the Father, and judgment, but most things are about Jesus and everything is about salvation. And Jonah watched all of it all the time. Not only was Jonah an Israelite, but Jonah was an Israelite prophet. He not only had access and privilege to know God and participate in serving and worshiping him, but he was appointed as God's mouthpiece. He received messages and missions from God. I assume that it's safe to say that his relationship with God went a step further than most other people's. Jonah had a high calling and a very prominent position. And he lived in Israel. And we know that Israel, despite their close connection to God and their intimate understanding of his true character, they were located right in the middle of a bunch of pagan nations. And so often, they were prone to being influenced by the cultures around them. Even though God was supposed to be their king, they begged God for a human king just like their neighbors. And oftentimes, they would look at the different deities that their neighbors were worshiping, and they would just adopt them and add them into their own worship and their own beliefs. They knew the truth about who God really was, but so often they acted like the cultures that were surrounding them, taking what they had with God for granted and desiring more control over their lives and over their destinies. They wanted to DIY their spirituality, kind of create their own thing. And as it turns out, Jonah was just like everyone else. So let's read Jonah 1. Verses 1 through 3. Jonah 1, 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, 
for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Something about this very familiar story and the way that Jonah wrote it jumps out at me. Jonah seems to be repeating himself a little bit, like he's trying to make a point. And the phrase that I see repeated is, from the presence of the Lord. Jonah was trying to get away from God. But why on earth would Jonah think that he could physically get away from God as an Israelite, as a prophet in Israel? Jonah knew good and well that God created the earth, God had complete dominion over the earth, and God was omnipresent. Years before Jonah's time, King David wrote what we know as Psalms 139. It's a great title. Psalms 139, verses 7 through 10. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. Jonah was familiar with this concept. But that concept wasn't necessarily a part of the pagan cultures around him, deities were associated with location, and you could get away from one deity by going somewhere else. The idea that you could escape God was pagan. So why was Jonah doing this? Did he really believe that he could escape God? Or was he simply letting the culture around him influence his subconscious and dictate his actions. He knew the truth about God, but in a tough situation, he sure did not act like it. But obviously, as the story of Jonah points out, you cannot run away from God. No matter how much Jonah wanted to run away from him, no matter how much he wanted there to be a place where he could escape God, escape God's pressure, him pressuring him doing into something he didn't want to do, Jonah couldn't escape reality. So as we continue to read the story, we see Jonah hops on a ship headed to Tarshish. Scholars believe that this was in Spain, which is super far away. So he picked a really good location. Um, and he settles in for a nice long nap, probably hoping that by the time he woke up, he wouldn't be able to hear God's voice anymore. All his responsibilities would be far behind him. But since God is everywhere, even in the sea where Jonah was, God sent a storm to keep the ship from reach reaching its destination. And it was a bad storm. And everyone on the boat thought that they were going to die. And the sailors were praying to as many gods as they could think of. But nothing was working and they were running out of options. And eventually they find Jonah snoozing. So they wake him up and they say, pray to your God. Now, if you're sharp and you pay attention you will notice that nowhere does Jonah write down that he ever prayed to God while he was on that ship. I don't know, maybe he did in his head, but he certainly didn't write about it. But what he does do is he says something that proves to us readers that Jonah knows exactly who God is, even when he doesn't act like it. Verse 9, so he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And I don't know about you, but that encompasses everything. Jonah knows that God is everywhere. But he doesn't always act like he knows that. He doesn't always think or make decisions like he knows that. Sometimes he lets the culture of the nations that sur were surrounding the borders of Israel to influence him. And so... The next part of the story is everyone's favorite part, except mine. I like to refer to this as my personal nightmare. 
Noah gets thrown overboard and swallowed by a fish. And suddenly, Jonah's faith comes back full force. In the worst place that I can possibly imagine. And I feel like Jonah would vouch for my opinion. When I get to heaven, Jonah and I were going to be like, yeah, we told everyone that fish were bad. So deep within the sea, <laughs> suffocating inside the stomach of a sea monster, tangled up in seaweed and stinging from stomach acid, Jonah wanted to get away from God, but now he wants God to be there <laughs> with him. Suddenly, God appreciates the truth about who God really is, this omnipotent, omnipresent, powerful, and hopefully merciful God. And I want us to read together the prayer that Jonah finally prays in chapter 2. Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I, can't pronounce that. I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. It is a beautiful prayer that rivals the Psalms. And what I love about this prayer is that it is about so much more than just the fact that God is everywhere. Yes, Jonah needed God to be inside that fish with him at that moment. But what Jonah needed even more from the omnipresent God that he served was mercy. Mercy was what Jonah needed most. Not only did he deserve death for his blatant, disobedient, and super bad attitude, but he was in a situation for which the only conceivable outcome is death. Right? Who survives getting thrown overboard in the middle of a storm? More than that, who survives getting swallowed whole by a great big fish? Even more than that, who survives being digested for three whole days inside a big fish at the bottom of the sea? Only someone who has received a ton of grace from a loving, patient, and merciful God. Jonah had DIY'd his destiny right into a fish. He had gotten himself into that mess, but he did not have the skills to get himself out. He had wanted to be in charge of his own life, and that's where it had got him. All he could do was cry out to God and hope that God would have mercy on him. And because God is the kind of God that we know God is, he did have mercy on Jonah. He heard Jonah's cry because he was there and he saved him. And this is really significant. The character of God, especially his mercy, is highlighted in the book of Jonah. And if you have not read Jonah for a while, do it today. Do it this afternoon. It is so good. You are going to love it. Jonah's honest portrayal of his own lack of concern for the Ninevites' well-being. His extreme ethnocentrism in desiring that the Ninevites should miss out on salvation. 
and his deep anger and bitterness over God's compassion for them serves as a striking contrast to the character of God and shame on us for behaving like Jonah in those ways. God is the hero of the story of Jonah. God's will is done despite Jonah's efforts to prevent it. God's power is wielded over nature and man. And God's love for humankind, regardless of race or religious background, is displayed with striking clarity against Jonah's attitude and actions. God is the hero of the story of Jonah because God is love and God is mercy. And this is incredibly significant to the story of Jonah. Jonah knows it, even though Jonah doesn't act like it. But I want us to look at one particular verse in Jonah's prayer. Jonah chapter 2, verse 8. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. That cuts me deep. That jumped off the page. I do not remember paying attention to that statement ever before when I read the book of Jonah. Earlier, I was talking about my world religions class. I know it did not seem like it had anything to do with what I was about to say, but here it is. My professor in that class pointed out something that is unique to Christianity. And that is the fact that God pays for our sins. It is the only major world religion which teaches that God pays for your sins. God fixes your sin problem, not you. And that is significant to my whole life. But so often we forget how significant that really is. We know the truth, but we let everything else around us influence how we behave and how we react and even how we think. It is natural, our natural human sinful tendency to reject God. And then logically follows the fact that we realize we need something. We are missing something from our lives. We are weak, we have needs, we have help. And rather than turning to God, a lot of times we decide that we're going to fill that position with something else. And for us, oftentimes that something else is our own good works or maybe a spiritual leader that we really look up to and stop thinking for ourselves. Or maybe proudly trying to figure out all of the intricacies and all the in and outs of every bit of prophecy that's in the Bible and thinking that our great knowledge is going to save us. Or maybe racking up success or security or happiness in this life. Or maybe even trying to draw admiration from other people. And in and of themselves, these are not bad things. But when we replace God with any one of them, we have begun to practice idolatry. And according to Jonah, in chapter 2, verse 8, idols are worthless. Anything that you rely on instead of God himself will fail you. And when each of these things fails, you are without mercy because none of those things can offer you mercy because mercy is unique to God. He is the only thing that can give you mercy. And as Christians, we should know this. I should know this. And I do. I know this. But how often do I act like I don't know this? And I start acting like the godless society around me, and I'm trying to find salvation in another way, even if I don't realize that that's what I'm doing, but I am trying to deify myself or deify other things other than God, everything but God. 
I'm trying to DIY my own savior. Have you ever wrestled with God over your sins? And I'm not talking about when God convicts you and says, you need to give that up. And you're like, no, I don't want to give it up. I love it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about wrestling with God when he says, I have grace for you. I have forgiveness for you. Give that sin to me and I will throw it in the bottom of the sea and I won't go after it this time. And we don't want to let it go and let him take care of it. We want to fix it ourselves. And if we can't do it, we want to find something else that can't because we are DIY kind of people. I know what that's like. But we don't have the ability or the authority to fix our sin problem. Only Jesus can and only Jesus does. And that is incredibly, incredibly significant. And if you feel like what I'm saying is kind of obvious, just do something with me for one second. I want you to honestly ask yourself, what if I did have to earn my own salvation? What if Jesus couldn't or wouldn't do that for me? This is significant. We have no reason to forfeit our own mercy. We know where it comes from, we know who it comes from, and we know how to get it. When I read what Jonah says, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, I have to ask myself, am I practicing idolatry? What have I decided to replace God with in my life? In what ways am I missing out on the mercy that he wants so desperately to give me because I don't want to take it? We are DIY kind of people. We don't want to let the professionals take care of things. We want to do it ourselves. But we have to admit that there are just some things that are not our job. My salvation is not my job. I need to let the professional handle it. And when I do, you guys, what sweet, sweet mercy washes over me and changes everything. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we know that you are with us this year with every single person who has struggled with feeling lonely in the midst of this pandemic, with every single person who has been treated less than in a country that behaves badly, with every single person that has worried and wondered, is everything going to be okay? You are there. Dear Lord, let us not miss out on your mercy because we're looking for it somewhere else. Let us come to you. Let us accept your forgiveness and let that sweet, sweet mercy wash over us and change everything. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. so much for being here. Hope you have a great Sabbath. We look forward to seeing you out here on the lawn next Sabbath. Remember, we all pray that there's no rain next Sabbath, and hopefully God will answer our prayers for that. So uh, look forward to seeing you out here next Sabbath again, 11 a.m. Look forward to seeing you there. Take care. God bless you.